Each Sunday night I'd watch the practice With none of my friends I'd turn the dial To ABC To see the creep of the week That Bobby Donald defends But I'm out Of practice With your hosts Keith Marnie Mike Indeglio. Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I missed the practice. There was no TiVo, what could I do? Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it on Hulu. My co-host said to me before we went on air is, I want to feast on your tears. It's true. Uh, The last thing I read on social media was that there's a dying mouse in your apartment. And welcome to the Out of Practice podcast, a weekly podcast in which we discuss David E. Kelly's award-winning series, the practice how's it going Degs? it's good I- i've come to learn that you can't hear me when i'm talking over the bumpers so yeah. i surely cannot so you didn't hear what i said there what i said was the last thing i read on social media was that there's a dying mouse in your apartment and i'd, I'd love the scoop oh yeah there sure is i mean if if you're a long time listener and if you're here obviously you are uh, yeah, you have heard much, uh-oh. much of the, uh-oh, uh-oh, Mike's gone. Mike's gone. He's gone. We lost I took a him. Pi- I took a picture. <laughs> He's back. Uh, but we have had a, a long running saga of, uh, mice issues in our apartment here in our beautiful apartment in Astoria, Queens. It's not beautiful and we can't wait to be gone. Uh, but yes, we found uh, a my a mouse on our kitchen floor this morning. Uh, that is mostly dead. We think it has been poisoned, and I'm not man enough to deal with it until it has left us. But we are both completely heartbroken, uh, and it is uh, it's gross and sad at the same time. You got to sweep it into a plastic bag, my friend, and just whack it against the wall. I think it's the humane thing to do. Uh, I mean, some version of that, I I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think at this point it is, I, I, I think it has left us. So um, okay. now it okay. just needs to to leave us, which uh, again, very, uh, very sad about it and uh, kind of ready to not be here anymore. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's time. Yeah, well, I keep looking at all of your fancy ass new apartment pictures and I'm like, we're living in a nest of uh, boxes, now boxes and uh, corpses. Mm. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's what uh, it's how someone tends to enjoy their holiday season. It is the holiday season. Christmas has Christmas. Uh, Jen, I thought that we had already finished Christmasing, but mm-hmm. she has today off. So uh, phase two. How has would you begun? have finished Christmasing? It's only uh, December 7th. Well, I meant like Christmasing the apartment. You know, like decorating. Oh, I see. I see. All right, Uh, all right. But phase two has begun today. Uh, She's she's at the store. More things are being purchased. I I don't know what's happening. But you know what? I'm letting her have this one. Uh, Well, no, and and I'm I'm with you. Like, I'm not a decorator, but Jillian is. Jillian is. And actually, over the years, I've grown to really enjoy when she, uh, you know, she will holiday up our various places. We're not doing that this year because we're essentially homeless. Uh, but <laughs> as soon as we get to the new house, we're gonna do all the holidays all at once. Let me tell you, let me just tell you, I'm, I'm very happy, I'm happy to be healthy, I'm appreciative of where we are. Everything is great. However, every time, people, there's a, you know, New York Christmas is a thing, and all television shows want to show you New York Christmas. And right. people are posting pictures from the CVS we used to buy our, tea, our tree from. And I'm very homesick for New York right now uh, during the Christmas season. But, you know, uh, it comes with the territory. All of my friends are buying homes right now. And and mm-hmm. I will say that. Uh, or trying to, to, at least. Yeah. 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 
we we tried to we had to break it to Jen's brother that we're not going out to Long Island for Christmas. You know, we do a my Christmas Christmas with my family, Christmas with her family, and then vacation Christmas year. Right. Uh, this was supposed to be vacation Christmas year, but COVID, and right. so we said, okay, well, we'll do Thanksgiving with my family and Christmas with Jen's family, but we just had to cancel that. Uh, so. We've yeah. come to the, we, we're at the thing where we're going to do Christmas here at our own apartment just by ourselves, but that's only 10 minutes down the road from my mother. So breaking that to her is, there's a lot of well, heartbreaking taking place this season. Yeah, no, and I, I, I texted you the SNL <clears throat> telling your parents you're not coming home for Christmas for because of COVID uh, sketch just about an hour ago. And yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of dealing with that too, um, as I mentioned, if you're not listening to this live, it is December 7th in the middle of the worst COVID outbreak in all of space and time. And uh, my parents basically have said, like, don't even bother. Like, don't come. Yeah, well, great. <laughs> like, Good. And, which I appreciate, honestly. I really do. And it, there's a lot of reasons. My, you know, my grandfather is ill and my mother's taking care of him. And so they're not even in the same place right now. But, um, you know, we have to sort of decide what we're going to do re the other side of the family and i and like what do we do do we go do we not go i feel a little irresponsible going but also it's complicated and i and i don't i mean it, the best thing for us all as a society were to be just like chill at home and and uh and quarantine yourself and make it nice as much as you can like we did for thanksgiving you know, Jill's and I had a, had a wonderful Thanksgiving all by ourselves. I mean, of course, we missed our families, but it's sort of more important that they, you know, survive. Yeah, I, I guess I, I don't know. Not to get too too deep into it, but you know, I went and got a test today, and my family's texting me, ribbing me, and they're like, "Well, what? You just got a test three weeks ago." But and I'm I I try to completely remind them that you know, when I was in New York, we were isolated. I didn't leave my apartment. And so right, there sure. was no need to be tested. But here, my family, God love them, is up my ass. They drop by. Um, I have to wear my mask in my apartment. Jen had to go back to work. She's working in restaurant with people. And I just, you know, if my mom's going to be around, and she is, I want to make sure we good. And of course. so Jen and I alternate every two weeks. One of us gets tested. And it's a drive through It's not like we're taking up, you know, lab or beds, you right, know, hospital right. time appointments from people who need it. Uh, we're trying to be as responsible as possible whilst allowing other folks to have their own, make their own risk assessment and, and judgments. And it's, those are really difficult things to, to uh, assess. Gel. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, and, I, and the social dynamics are just really, I mean, the social dynamics around the holidays are already right. crazy fraud. And this year, even even more so. Well, Anyhow. anyway, anyway, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> COVID still a thing, uh, still happening. Anyway, all right. So, I want to do something this week that we should probably get in the habit of doing every week, and that is show our uh -oh. contact in. Uh oh, uh oh. I'm small. Damn it! I'm like the mouse dying on the floor. All right, well, okay, you keep talking, I'll fix okay. it. Okay, all right. Well, and, and that is, I think we should give out our contact info earlier in the episode when anybody is still watching so people can reach out so uh. that Phoenix doesn't just have to moderate himself. So I built us some new slides, so sure why don't did, you man. throw those up, and I will just quickly say you can reach us at out of practice podcast on Facebook and Instagram. You can email us directly and we check it. It's us. We reply out of practice podcast at gmail.com. You can check the blog out of practice podcast.blogspot.com, which I have abandoned. It's lost in the wilderness, <laughs> but I promise I'm going to get back to it. You can do us a huge favor and join the jury by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting service of your choice. If it's not Apple Podcasts, let us know because we want to give you full credit, read it out loud, and welcome you to the jury. You don't have to give us five stars. You get to be on the jury either way, guilty or innocent. You get to be part of it. So uh, there it is. Well done, sir. Well done. Uh all right, so it's time to move forward into the show, and we have some pretty exciting filings and subpoenas. Filings oh. and subpoenas. Filings and subpoenas. Filings and subpoenas. Well, our 
most frequent contributor and moderator of himself on the YouTube's Phoenix Cage said a couple of things. Uh, first off, he said, Keith, I must be as old as you because eight months ago I was happy to have found this three-sided power strip that maximizes space without any plugs blocking each other. I mounted it to the back of my office entertainment center and reorganized a couple dozen cables. And he said, if you're curious about Phoenix's power supply and want to see it on Amazon, he put the link right there on YouTube. So check it out. I was so excited about my new power supply for my computer. And uh, because we are men of a certain age, who doesn't love plug management systems? He also wrote uh, about my comment. Uh, we're talking about trauma <laughs> in in our comedy podcast and, and <laughs> about how <laughs> hilarious. Uh, and how often worse than the trauma is the lack of support of people around you. And he quoted me saying, worse than the trauma is the lack of support. He said, Keith, yes, absolutely. I experienced it myself a few years ago. This may be repurposing of a quote, but it remains true. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And that is a Dr. Martin Luther King quote that has actually been making the rounds a fair yeah. bit of late. And, uh, it, it's always appropriate, but certainly has been uh, very uh, tip of the tongue of late. Um, so, yeah, very uh, good points. Now, moving on, uh, we got something very special uh, from our good friend. Is this friend the thing? Is this the and thing? Founding supporter Jennifer Masanova, who. Uh, May have uh, sent it slightly delayed, but she has sent something just for you. Now, I put up our logo for the first seven seconds just to make sure you did not have the surprise spoiled. So, well, let's... you also named the video Mike Don't Watch. Mike Don't Watch. I, 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 it was clear, right? It, you, you knew not to watch it. I haven't watched. Of course, knowing you, that's like guaranteed you're going to watch it. No, that well, that's the best part of this whole podcast for me is I don't have to do anything. I don't have to pre-watch. I don't have to prepare. I just kind of <laughs> that's true. Show that, up. Yeah, that's yeah, fair enough. And fiddle the buttons. And yeah, well, you you do the editing afterwards. I do all the work sure. ahead of time. You do the work after. So. And and we have to stop this Monday thing because I cannot. It, I it, it literally. Well, it doesn't take well, too long. It's probably three hours all told. One of it, us keeps forgetting that it's Saturday on Saturday. And I'm like, yeah. hey, are we rolling? They're like, wait, is it Saturday? So T time is complain more of an to idea. yourself, sir. Complain yeah. to yourself. Time is an idea. Should I roll it? Let's roll it. All right. Hopefully, you can hear it. All right. So I just put this logo here to fake you out. It's our logo. It's it's very fancy. Hi, Mike. Calvin with the Columbus Zoo here. We received a call from Jennifer who said that she was slow in getting you a happy birthday message this year. So happy 40th birthday from us here at the zoo as well as our slow friend, Sid the Sloth. Hope it's a great one, Mike. Hi, Mike. My name's Emily and this here is Ray and he's one of our cheetahs here in the ambassador program at the Columbus Zoo. Now, we heard that you and Jen really like cats, and Ray is one of the coolest animals that we have here in our department. Cheetahs are the fastest land animal in the world. They can reach speeds of up to 60 miles per hour in just three seconds. So they're one of the most amazing cats in the world. Now, Ray and I really wanted to wish you a happy 40th birthday. We hope you have a fabulous day. Just happy birthday from not only Ray and I, but everyone else at the Columbus Zoo. And Jennifer wanted to thank you especially for the amazing podcast that you did. We hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. And this is just a bonus clip to prove that the sloth wasn't stuffed. So there it is. I don't even know what to say. She got me a Columbus Zoo cameo, double cameo? Double cameo from like from a sloth and a cheetah. Oh my God. Well, which one of us is the, is the sloth and which one of us is the cheetah, I guess is the question. Oh, that's, uh, you know, we'll submit that to our listeners. Guys, write in, hashtag Keith is sloth, hashtag Mike is <laughs> cheetah, or vice versa. Um, Jennifer, how cool is that, huh? That 
That is super cool. I received three cameos for my birthday this year. Did you? Um, I did. I'll, I'll quickly uh, tell you which, what they were. So uh, clearly the Columbus Zoo, Cheetah. So it, it should be noted what Jennifer doesn't even know is that growing up, one of my favorite games I played with my sister, one of our imaginary games was called Cheetah. No where, kidding. Wherein I would play a cheetah. I would my, I would be a cheetah that my sister, who was a vet tech, stole from a lab experiment. They were going to experiment on this cheetah. Mm -hmm. And so I was like living in her apartment in the big city. And we would I'd get into fights in slow motion. And she would put red nail polish on me, which I'd be all nicked up. And then her, as the vet, would use nail polish remover to take it off me. So it turns out that's a little this day in the basement connection to cheetah. So that's awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. I also received, uh, I'm a big fan of Big Brother, as we discussed, and mm -hmm. one of the contestants this year, his name was Memphis, he's the one they just picked out of the blue to make the bad guy, the villain. Uh -huh. You know how they always edit somebody as the villain? Well, sure, yeah. And I made a comment to a family member that, you know, I think that he is the, you know, he got a raw deal this year because he's just playing the game and they edited him to be the villain. And I got a, a cameo from Memphis thanking me <laughs> for having his back. And he actually got like really uh, emotional and serious on the cameo. And he's like, you know, like I didn't think the fallout from the way they edited me was gonna be so bad in my personal life. He's like, so I, I really appreciate that some people got the, understand that it's not really me. And I was like, this was deep. Oh my and then, God. And then third, way back when I'm about seven years old, my dad took me and my brother to our first professional wrestling event. Mm -hmm. And we were walking into the Wildwood Convention Center in New Jersey, and this oh, car I know comes Wildwood. Yeah, this car comes around the corner and almost runs me over, and stops and gets out of the car and apologizes for almost hitting me as a child, like running me down. And it was this wrestling wrestler from the '80s named Coco Beware. Uh, he had like a parrot, and he was like, oh, "I'm the Birdman." Anyway, oh, my brother. Yeah, sure. Yeah, my brother. That guy's still alive, and my brother got a cameo of him wishing me a happy birthday. So. Uh, what a menagerie of cameos I received. <laughs> so we got a we got a sloth, a parrot, Coco Beware, Memphis, and uh the cheetah. So thank I you, mean, one and all. Yeah, how cool is that? I mean, I and I was like, I was so delighted uh when Jennifer sent those. She's on the board. So she was oh, able to make that happen. Uh, that's awesome. But but she says that the uh, the Columbus Zoo does a lot of cameos now to help sort of make up the the funding and that that they have from lack of ticket sales. So so someday. if you have a loved one, if you have a loved one who is, has a special yes. day coming up or for the holidays, make sure to reach out to the Columbus Zoo on Cameo and support them. Uh, we the zoos need our uh, our support they, during this time. They certainly do. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm hope that. Uh, uh, once uh, this is all done, we can go visit in uh, in real life. It looks like a good zoo. Like there's there's nothing sadder than a bad zoo, but yeah, good zoos. Can Although I would imagine that important. when the spring and summer rolls around and the vaccines start coming, the zoo's a nice outdoor activity. Yeah, uh, most for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So here's uh, here's hoping. Well, that was delightful, delightful. and uh, and super fun. Oh, oh, oh. I'm oh. giant. I'm, I'm, I'm even more giant. I don't. I just I wish I understood the what's happening per se. But, I'm you know. giant. <laughs> there I am. Okay. <laughs> just gotta go with it. Yeah. Just gotta, you're, just gotta you're whatever really happens. You just have comedian? to go. Comedian. Comedian. All right. We are talking about this week, season five, episode twelve, entitled Payback, and it aired on January. 14th, the year 2001. And that brings up, Mike, what were you doing? This Wait. day in the basement. Oh, I, I I can answer you that question, Keith, but uh, I can can't you? show you the thing just yet until I uh, resize you there. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay no. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, God. It's still our logo. Oh, God. Oh, we're going to hear from the cheetah again. Oh, God. I was oh, for this. boy, it's a... It's craziness, craziness happening. All right, well, January 14th. Yes. 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a picture and I have, didn't load it in, but this, um, so on- Just I'm act gonna, it out, act I'm out gonna, the picture. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. So my dad was still, uh, you know, in the recovery center, nursing home situation. But every year growing up, New Year's, 
I think I've mentioned this in the past. It was like one of the only times we would do something with my dad's side of the family. We would go to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where my dad's uncle, but they were this almost the same age, so they were sort of like brothers. So we called him Uncle Joe, even though he was, I guess, our cousin. I, I don't, I, I don't know. But regardless, family. we would go there, and there'd be like a giant group of people of my dad's side of the family, and we'd hang out. And my aunt Charlotte was like a drummer, so. And there were some guitar players, so they would oh, they cool. would like get a, a rock band going, and it was just like such an awesome thing. And we'd we'd rock in New Year's it into the new year. And this was we even though my dad couldn't be with us, we went anyway. And I remember this being one of the last years we really did it, because after my dad died, my 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 grandmother on my dad's side sort of went a little dementia y. I mean, losing a a child is you know that'll I wreck can't you even anyway. imagine. Yeah. So I remember this being one of the last sort of fun ones we went to, and uh, we would all, they'd always have the big Dick Clark on the uh, on the jumbotron. They'd like put a little projector screen up, and we'd watch that and such. So I actually queued up uh, to remind ourselves, you know, and earlier in the broadcast, uh, you see Ju- Rudy Giuliani, but I, I've cut through him because uh, <laughs> we're, not, we're not giving him any more airtime. <laughs> oh my god. He's dealing with enough right now, I guess. Oh, he's anyway. So here's the here's down. how we rang in the new year in 2001. Little did we know that later that year, uh, shit was gonna hit the fan and the world was gonna change yet again. Yeah. But uh, this was our pre-terrorism life in New York City, and uh, actually, it's pre-Mike too. I didn't quite move there yet. So, did you had you moved to New York just yet? No, I still had one more year All at right. school. All right, I will go later this year, but here we go. Oh, no. Look at him. I got to bring it up, and I got to hit play. Hold on. I thought I was ready. Talk You're not ready. Yourself. Okay. Oh, here we go. 20 seconds. In 15. Looks like it might be hitting that Oh, it's a bit. What's going to happen? They've never, they've never replaced Dick Clark. Never. No, because you know, it's this whole thing. It's this whole brand. Muhammad Ali. With Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I'm so curious, Keith. I mean, this is going to be the first year in decades that you're not going to see this scene. Yeah. In next month, it's going to be really trippy. That's true. Yeah. Well, a lot of things are. Yeah. I mean, it's just the. The beginning, or just like the tip of the iceberg of all the things that are weird and different uh, oh. this year. He is just a, such a sweet man. Like, Dick Clark's entire career in life is such a showbiz... Sorry, I'm, I'm really in this right now. My you're feels... You're just like in... I'm in the feels of a, a different well, I time. Mean, your, your New Year's tradition sounds like a lot of fun. I would love to get like family together and jam on New Year's every year every year yeah i mean it really uh it really highlights my boyfriend and i were talking about it this morning you know it was it was such a shame because it was the only time we had really any connection with my father's side of the family he kept them at arm's distance i'll never understand Ooh. why i'm sure there were our reasons some good some stupid i'm sure but it's such a and be and because of that i barely have any contact with them now and and mm. It's uh, it's sad. So it, as many things happen as you age, things, be, memories that are good memories become bittersweet memories. And, you know, that just happens with nostalgia in general, I think. But I'm trying to make a conscience ef- conscious effort moving forward to try to replace some of the bittersweetness with just joy, you know, and just kind of remember the joy because... Uh, there's just I just want to make more room in my life for for appreciation and joy, if that makes any sense. Especially as we round out this crazy, crazy year. Yeah. Well, I I think it makes a great deal of sense, and I think as we get older, not only do we add more memories, but we add context to old memories, and so it's my understanding of everything is continually changing, is continually growing and adapting and how I'm reacting to it is continually changing and growing and reacting. And, you know, especially when you're dealing with family and history, you're, you're sort of rewriting 
the history yeah. and the present and the future over and over again. And you're and you're never changing what happened, but you are changing how you react to it and what the reasons are and and this that the other thing. And I I feel like that's certainly in my last ten years, so much has been rewritten about myself and my relationships and my and my the context of sort of like how we are founded and and what to do about it. And as our parents are getting older and you're starting to think about like, you know, what do I want this relationship to be? It doesn't change anything good, bad, or ugly, but what do I want this relationship to be and how do I want to relate? And I think it's, it's been really, it's been very interesting. All right. Well, before we get too dark, let us, uh, Wait, whoa, whoa, what were you doing? Oh, well, I did that. Oh. Well, let me tell you what I was doing and what I'm going to do this week, uh, partially due to the circumstances of the date and partially because somebody uh, gave me a lot of shit last week, Phoenix, and I would like to combine my favorite segment with this and do super mega Sports ball! It's time, it's time, time, it's time, it's time for sports ball. Super <laughs> mega sports ball. Last week I screwed up the date and missed some very important sports ball updates. In the 2000 wild card matchup, the Philadelphia Football Eagles beat the Bucks 21-3 to advance to the division matchup with the New York Football Giants. Ron Dixon returned the opening kickoff 97 yards to put the Giants up 7-0. I'm setting the scene. This is last week. After a Brad DeLuiso field goal put the Giants up 10-0 in the second quarter, Jason Seahorn did this. Oh, shit. Which one is it? The first one the first or the one. second one? First one. All right. So the uh, Giants were up 10-0 in the second quarter against the New York or the Philadelphia Football Eagles in the division round. And then this happened. The biggest thing to stop that frustration is a little success, but I think the fact that they're only down by 10 still gives them a little hope. They haven't been able to do Remember anything. This? And they're only down by 10 points. McNabb throws. And the pass is almost picked up. It is picked it up. Is. Seahorn came up with it. Jason Seahorn is going to take it in. Seahorn takes it in in what was ranked by NFL.com. You he can stop it. First I'm enjoying this so much. Is ranked by the as the seventh best interception in NFL history by NFL.com. Well, after this happened, McNabb threw a garbage touchdown in the fourth quarter, but it only see, made it seem closer than it was as the Giants advanced to the division to the conference championship round after a 20 to 10 victory. Then, you like this, Phoenix? We're just gonna go for as long as I want. Then on a field of painted mud, the New York football giants put up a performance of the for the ages in the conference championship game. On the opening drive, this happened. In the Viking, the right side was Sean Payton, the offensive coordinator. Camella went in motion. Here's Collins back to throw. Time. Great Collins. Oh! Touchdown. Ike Hilliard scored a 46-yard touchdown on the opening possession. The Vikings fumbled the following kickoff. The next play, Collins hit Greg Camella for another touchdown, giving the Giants 14 points in three plays. Kerry Collins eventually threw five touchdowns, four in the first half, in front of 78,000 berserk fans at Giants Stadium. The Giants would advance to Super Bowl 30. Five with a 41 to nothing victory over the Minnesota Vikings. Ike Hilliard had a career game with 10 catches, 155 yards, and two touchdowns. The Giants would head to Tampa to play Trent Dilfer and the Baltimore Ravens in the Super Bowl. And if you think I gave a shit about anything else this day, you are sorely mistaken. That wow. is my day in the basement and super mega sports ball. So, dear listeners, and <laughs> Phoenix specifically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. join me, whether you like sports or football at all this year, especially in this crazy year, join mm -hmm. me in hoping, and this is, I'm saying this as an Eagles, forced Eagles fan, because right now they don't deserve any fandom, mm -hmm. but let's all hope that the New York football giants 
make their way into the playoffs at four and eight or whatever, four and nine. Five or, and seven, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. A, a sub-eight win team probably will make it to the NFC, oh, uh, no, the NFC champion, yeah. Championship. And let's all watch them get absolutely pummeled in the playoffs, <laughs> and then we'll all come back to the Out of Practice podcast and, and watch Keith uh, cry his his New York giant tears and we'll all feast upon them together as friends. How about that? That sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. And uh, I, I'm not saying I don't deserve it. You tell a heartfelt family story and then I mock <laughs> your team <laughs> for right. an extended sports Roll ball. Roll that Eric William Morris bumper. Yes. Not that. That's the wrong one. <laughs> it's time for the Out of Practice Podcasts This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. As we mentioned, we are of course talking about Season 5, Episode 12. Still going. Payback. Still going. This was January 14th, the year 2001, and of course, Independent Woman by Destiny's Child continued tearing up the number one charts. The local paper talked about a quake rocks El Salvador. El Salvador. There was a horrible earthquake and landslides that killed almost a thousand people. Let's all dance to that horrible news. Rudy the top Giuliani, movie, mayor of New York, was sane and respected. He was... One of those things. The uh, <laughs> top movie was Save the Last Dance, starring Julia Stiles and Sean Patrick Thomas. This is actually like a whole bunch of live musicians doing this. Sounds amazing. All right. Thank you really so good. much, independent women. Now, I will uh, spare Phoenix doing yet another sports ball. In fact, I'll concede anything I had even remotely planned to do. Let's just move to uh, I'm what's a human next. being. God damn it. My life has value. And I'm not going to take this anymore. It's time to talk about the damn episode. Mike, it's almost like you have a heart out at four or something. Well, maybe I do. Maybe I'm in a show <laughs> called A Christmas Karen at SeizeTheShow.com. <laughs> after Christmas rehearse. Karen. Sometimes these she like is, she like calling uh, the police on black kids in the street. Uh, I, it's a table read, so I actually don't know what it's about, but I do know uh, this is one of those events. Where, you know, remember when you were like young and you wouldn't get a part, or you'd get a smaller part in the show and you'd be like bummed out. Sure. It's a crazy how things change because in the past few weeks, so very, very luckily the the seize the show dot com venture is. Uh, Picking up a little steam, and so now we're getting paid uh, more appropriately uh, oh, for fantastic. our work. And you know, we were smart enough to uh, do what they call in the biz a favored nations clause. Ah, uh, smart. So that the resident company, the, those of us who started from the beginning, get uh, paid the same regardless of what we happen to be doing that week, because your role changes show to show. This is one of those times, Keith. I'm loving it because I have, I think, maybe three lines in the whole <laughs> thing. So it is like, it's like, say your two funny lines and collect that paycheck, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. But you boy, still can't be late, a, still can't be late. It is different when you're older. <laughs> All right, so we are talking about season five, episode 12, entitled Payback. This show was written by David E. Kelly, surprise, surprise, and Mark Guggenheim, who is the first time writer on The Practice. He wrote on... DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow, Flash Forward. He created the show Eli Stone, which I understand to be an underrated gem, and wrote on Law & Order. It was directed by Andy Wolk, who last directed Checkmates, mm. which leaves us only one thing to do. What is that supposed to mean? What's your problem? This is how guitars is this work, what right? What happens to women when you insert your penis? Gross. What? What? What, what does Mike think's gonna happen? Yeah, you know, what if he would have drank the curdled milk? Then what, what would have happened? happened? Keith, you may not remember, 
because it was a really subtle thing that happened, but uh, Boppy killed somebody? Oh, yeah, right. There's uh, There was something about him when he uh, decapitated. Uh, he, he got a very his. subtle 12-foot uh, gangster to mm -hmm. scare Mr. Hinks. And I guess by scare, he meant chop his head off and put it in the freezer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that happened. My guess for payback is that... Um, I don't see a universe in which Bobby isn't uh, at least suspected, even though Ray Bruto at the end of the last episode said he there were no suspects yet. But I suspect this comes back around to Bobby. Uh, you would hope, yeah. It'd be pretty bad storytelling if it didn't. So I'm going to... We're we're getting closer. We have 10 episodes. I think this feel, really feels like an arc that would be better at the end of the season. But uh -huh. I'm going to go for it. Big swings. Bobby's going to get fingered for this as either a conspirator to murder or, or or as a murderer. Okay. Uh because clearly there's evidence all over the wall that Hinks was obsessed with Lindsay. Right. Which ties directly to Bobby. So, I think we're going to have a bifurcated case or bifurcated episode. We're going to have the the trial of Bobby, okay? Defended by I guess it's got to be the team, the firm, right? It's got to be our, our 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 characters. Well, here's a good question. So, if you if you're Bobby on trial, who do you want to be the lead person defending you amongst our heroes? Eugene. I want Eugene with second chair Eleanor. That's what I want. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. But big swing. Big behind, swing. Behind the scenes, Helen and Lindsay are doing like some Columbo slash PI investigation, trying to find out what really happened. And 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 uh, operating behind behind the scenes. Okay, that doesn't uh, answer what the hell Q two means or what the episode payback means. So yeah. I don't know, but uh, but if you are watching, I just put my head in my own freezer because that's yeah. where uh, my that's where Hinks ended up. You know what? I'm gonna uh, can I change it to my big swing? Yeah, Lindsay. Not only she's out for blood, like she wants to F this guy up. Like maybe maybe he meets an untimely end as well. 12 foot uh, hitman. So Lindsay kills the hitman Bobby hired, hired to, to kill Hanks. To scare Hanks. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we're about to find out whether you're right. So it is time to click over to your favorite podcasting service of choice. Listen to us. Listen to the episode. And we'll be right back here for the oopsies. This is scandalous. What is this picture here? It's a good, well, you know, she's pregnant. That's true. What will she do without Bobby? Bobby's a, if, can she be with a man who's potentially capable of, of hiring a hitman? That's a good, it's a good question. And also we'll have to discuss Bobby's PJs at some point. <laughs> we'll see you after the episode. <laughs> and we are Back and Keith is huge. I'm enormous. Here, I'll zoom out or I'll zoom in. Oh, no, no, God, what's it. happening? I what's happening? All, all right, I'll let you anything. do it. I'll let you do it. But first, I'm going to let you do what our favorite, my favorite part of the show. And that is... Mike has 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. Y'all, everybody's pissed. Bobby's on trial for murder. Did he kill that guy? Did he order to kill that guy? There's many hairs to be split. Eugene's in charge now. He always pissed. And he's telling people to do their job. He's in charge. He's the general. But the general also told Rebecca to do that thing where she got in trouble for, like, you know, the money thing and all. So she's real pissed. <laughs> Jimmy opens the door. Eugene walks in. Rebecca doesn't walk out. We don't know what's going to happen. Kelly Williams is scared. And we got to wait to find out what happens with Bobby. Yes, indeed. Yes, Rebecca did that money thing. <laughs> And oh, yeah. we're going to talk about it when we do our thing called... Ladies and gentlemen, the Out of Practice Podcast, in unofficial, unsolicited, unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions, proudly present... Oopsie! The Oopsies! Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good... 
and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now, here are your hosts, Keith and Mike. What the hell are the oopsies? Well, Jackie, they are a fake award show we do at the end of every episode of the Out of Practice podcast, which begins with the Well, um, well, I mean, <laughs> Rebecca doesn't like that she got an easy 150K. Right. Uh, but that said, the law firm does need it right now. It but surely I, does. But I, 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 I don't think we can overlook Eugene Young, who was thrust into a leadership role Delegating responsibilities, arguing in court, leading the troops, approaching the other guys, uh, the the hitmans, for lack of a better term, his lawyer to put, to get into his head to hopefully garner some information, playing all the angles. I just don't think you can. I think as of now, as far as value is concerned, he is, and, and he is directly responsible for making Rebecca get that money. So I think that as far as valuable, the most valuable lawyer for the firm right now, I think you can't look any further than uh, Eugene Young. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It, it's, it's actually one of the things I really like about this episode is everybody is a little bit right. Yeah. That that uh, Rebecca is right that it was that this was clearly extortion and that ethically they shouldn't be a part of this. Eugene is right that, you know, legally it's not her job to call balls and strikes on ethics. It's, it's to do the job as told to by her client. And if she can't prove that it's shitty, she just needs to represent her client. And so he's right about that as well. And, uh, and I think Eugene is absolutely the person I would want defending me right now. And mm -hmm. I think he's doing everything he can. However, Eugene also, and uh, and Eleanor, lost all of the things he was trying to do. And who won but the new dick of the week bad guy, Martin Toomey, the new DA played by Stephen Flynn, who at least at this point has really set up a situation where he's got Bobby pretty much dead to rights, won the motions to uh, to make him open to, fel to felony murder. For me, I think it's got to be D.A. Uh, Martin Toomey. Okay, there you have it. Little Splitsy. Little Splitsy, congratulations, Eugene and Martin Toomey. It is now time to declare our... Already, Already famous, famous. Cause you've been on TV Getting a pay hey, check First entry on your IMDB Way to go But you're the best guest actor You are the best guest actor You are the best guest actor on the episode uh, Speaking of Martin Toomey uh, He was played by Stephen Flynn Stephen Flynn who I thought was pretty good in this episode as our uh, antagonist. Um, you know, the two other players, Q and Lady that conspired with Q, uh, mm -hmm. some of my favorites, you know, uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't really do a lot. And so I will not award them. So that guy I just said his name a few seconds ago. Stephen Keith Flynn. Will, Keith will yes. speak about more eloquently right now. No, I think I think you're right. I think um, the way they tried to hide John Delancey <laughs> was having him n not do any Delanceyisms. Mm -hmm. So he was very not Q. He wasn't funny. He wasn't snarky. He was sort of like straightforward and kind of a little bit heartfelt. And so it was it was a very non Delancey Delancey performance, which again, which he had like. That dude has range, like you wouldn't believe. You see him on Breaking Bad, you're like, "Oh my god, that's Q." Uh, but it makes it, I, I don't understand why you hire him. 
right. if you're not going to have him do what he can do, it's a it's a very strange because like you've already used him doing that sort of a sort of a role. There's a gazillion actors in the world. Like Delancey doesn't need the work. And like I don't know why I don't know why you would use yeah, him you, again it's, and it, not it, use him. It it seems almost like it, it was like a last minute replacement kind of situation. But at the same time, why wouldn't you then just use a like a random? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It it, it wasn't a showy enough part that you needed some star power. Right. And it it was it was odd. It was odd casting. I mean, I'm he is always welcome. If yes. he wants to come and like read the phone book to me, I will be thrilled. Nobody but makes phone it, books anymore, Keith. Nobody makes phone books anymore. I'm old. I'm, I'm not 40. Mechanisms. I'm 40. Anyway, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think it is Stephen Flynn. Um, it, because he's he had to do a lot of groundwork creating a an antagonist in one episode. Keith, this very just quickly. in this just in. Mm. Uh President Trump has awarded a full and uncontested pardon to Stephen Flynn. Uh, unfortunately, I think he's made a mistake as to who he meant to give that pardon. But nonetheless, uh, ah, Stephen ah. Flynn is given a full pardon. Oh, congratulations. Wow. I mean, I don't know. Did he cheat on his tax or something like that? You know, it's so so Trump did what you've done all episode, and yes. that is get one of the names right and one of the names wrong. Correct. Great. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, I thought he did a, he did a really good job uh assholing and making us uh dislike him even though his case is pretty straightforward he kind of kind of has him he's going to send bobby to prison and where he'll be doing his own assholing <laughs> okay <laughs> you killed your podiatrist or blew the case but you let a single tear run down your face or multiple You're the best Actor on the show. And I really want to award. What you think here? It's I interesting. I really want to award Kelly, but, but, oh, or Steve, or Dylan. Oh, they're all in contention here. It's a tough one this week. They all have. Kelly Williams is just excellent, and she had some great scene, some great scenes, but not a not a huge swath of them. And we love Steve when he is in full Eugene, and he was given the they took the reins off here. But I tell you what, Lisa Gay had a great that last scene with Lisa Gay was incredible too. Mm -hmm. The ensemble this week really in Cameron in court. You know, right? can, have we ever awarded best actor to the ensemble before? We have not. No, I don't know that we've ruled it out. I think. I would. I'm waffling between Steve and Bob, Steve and Dylan here. But the on Lucy didn't say anything. She gave us exposition. She was a good she exposition. Bob. I I really think this week it finally felt like the whole team was back together in the show together, and and that has that is a welcome relief to yeah. some of the complaints we've had recently so i would like to if if the jury will allow if, if the judge will allow it i'd like to Ooh. reward to the ensemble here which we don't do usually but i think they were all effective even the inter office drama that one scene was right one of the With more Michael. powerful yeah. scenes and really kind of encapsulated where we are in the sort of grand arc and i think that is just as important to this episode as what bobby is into so that's what i'd like to say Wow. Will we allow the precedent to be like our, our it's it is a little bit of judicial advocacy here because you're gonna break precedent mm -hmm. and uh and give it to the ensemble. Yeah, I mean I, I I will tell you this, you might be the MVL of this segment because when you began proposing this, I was I I was guilty. I was like, no way. I was I was I was going to shut down your motion, but I think you have convinced me, and I think I'll allow it, guys. For the first time ever, the best actor goes to the ensemble cast wow. of the practice. Wow, deserve it. Unexpected, deserve it. unexpected. Yeah, and I no, I agree with you. I I was like I was torn. I think I was probably going to go with Lisa Gay. 
she was but great. But Steve deserved it, and Dylan deserved it, and uh, they all did. I mean, they really did. So congratulations, the ensemble. It's now time for... The Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. Take a peek. Tom Brady's head in Keith's actual freezer, Tom Brady. This was... Uh, in case exactly you were wondering what was in my freezer at that moment, there it is, folks. This is exactly what I asked you for, so thank you for that. Uh, this week, you know, the episode was pretty straightforward, and... Uh, it's really hard to sort of parody via Tom Brady. So, uh, um, I've got it. Okay. But, but, say for breaking precedent. Yeah. I would like to propose that the Tom Brady award for being Tom Brady to go to Q Brady. Q Brady. Well, th since we're breaking precedent, then I'll tell you how we'll flip it. Okay. Because clearly you're the Trek guy and I am not. Yes. So since we flipped it, this week I will have to be responsible for sending you the Photoshop yes! Q Brady. Yes, you okay. will. Oh, I love it. I just, okay. that made me so excited, maybe because I don't have to do it. <laughs> and I have to do uh, some research to find a funny Q reference to do. Okay, so there there's, you go. Yeah, Congratulations to Q Brady. Congratulations, Q Brady! All right, now it is time to cue the. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to announce how many spare tires this episode gets. You started the episode by kind of lamenting that it was sort of ridiculous and blah, 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 but it turns out to be really excellent. I think, as we've already mentioned, the acting across the board, excellent. And the stakes are really high, and the stakes are not even just for this case. The stakes of the arc of the series are on the line here. Bobby's relationship is on the line. The life of Bobby as a father and of his unborn child are on the line. The life of the firm, their reputation, and their future on the line. And all of that is written really deftly. And like Keith mentioned earlier, and we discussed briefly in the episode, uh, the the writing supports finally Bobby, where he's at mentally, where he is in his decision-making. It seems he's come back to earth. We're set up with a huge quagmire. We have a, we have a reasonable, we have a reasonable offer on the table for a plea. And we have Bobby promising his wife and child that he's going to be acquitted and that he's gonna fight to tooth and nail. We've got Eugene in charge and his leadership being questioned. We've got a rift in the dynamic of the firm. This is everything I love about the practice. We've got an interesting case, we've got huge stakes, and we've got people acting rationally, yet high tension. So, these are great things. Uh, I hope that we can see them through, but nonetheless, as a standalone episode, I think I will give it 8.5 spare tires. Thank you, one and all. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with no! everything. You did. No, you did it again. Every podcast. time. That's the wrong button. That's the Damn. wrong button. Make yeah, you I, big. Yeah, I'm big. I, I agree with everything that you said. I think you put it really well. And I, I think as a writer, especially in an episodic like this, or really in anything, what you want to do is put your heroes in tough spots. Back them into corners. And oftentimes when a show is lazily written or sort of poorly done, you back them into sort of straw man corners where it's not, the jeopardy isn't real. There's always, or there's some sort of an out. There's some sort of a clever twist that they, they can get themselves out of jeopardy without having to use the full extent of their abilities to not be the smartest, cleverest, best version of your characters to get them out of real jeopardy. And that's what I really like about this episode. It's what you said. The stakes are real. He's not being uh, accused of a murder he didn't do. He's not sort of, it's, it's not so obviously unfair what the judge or even what the DA is doing. It's all kind of fair. He really has backed him his characters into a real problem. And the problem that he got himself into 
kind of makes sense. Based on the characterization leading up to it, the A to B to C here kind of makes sense. The, the, the recklessness of Bobby has been demonstrated before. So we've gotten ourselves into this problem in a way that, like, I get it. So the stakes feel both logical and super high. As I mentioned uh, during the episode itself, the conflict with Eugene taking over and Rebecca's reaction to it and Jimmy's reaction to Rebecca, I've complained a lot about the conflict within the office feeling forced and arbitrary. And you've got Eleanor taking swings at Li at Lucy. You've got people brawling over the desk with Eleanor and Lindsay. And it is, felt so forced and stupid. Where this kind of makes sense because all sides in that equation have good points. And they're all a little bit right. And they're all uh, appropriate to their character. Eugene is the guy who's going to sort of follow the letter of... The, the sort of legal aspects of what they're responsible for and sort of throw out the morality of it. And Rebecca is the character who's going to think about the morality of it. So it is logical to their characters as well. So uh, I really liked how this episode was written. I, I just thought it was like, I, I'm really excited to see what happens next. I like this storyline. It For the first time, one of our uh, characters accused of a crime that makes sense, that doesn't feel forced, it doesn't feel like a stunt, which mm -hmm. it frequently has felt like. So uh, for all of those reasons, as well as really good performances, I'm excited for next week. I, yeah, me too. You know, at, at this point, it's been set up in such a way that I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Like there's no obvious out here for Bobby. Um, Especially so this early in the season. and. You know, I know you know the answer to this, or maybe you forget, is, you know, we've already shown, or they, they've, the creatives have already shown that they're willing to go a nine episode arc. They're yep. willing to go. So maybe we'll get that. And this case at least has the interest level for me to let's do it. Although I don't know that it has, there are as many witnesses to call. So we'd have to see a lot of stuff outside right. of the courtroom. But, you know, hopefully they'll, hopefully it'll get, hopefully the bar we're setting, they'll see it through. Well, and that's it, it. It is answering the complaint we have had through the whole Bruce Davidson case, which yes. was the stakes. We're we're all running around acting like the stakes here are really high, but because we don't know Bruce Davidson, we have no investment in the character. We, I, I'm not sure why we care. Well, now we care. Like I'm not sure what I, you know, what I'm rooting for, but I sure as hell care about the outcome. Yeah. So, uh, all of that leads up to. I'm going to give this an 8.75. I think it's, I really like this. And if they're able to take this and conclude this in a satisfying way, we're going to start cranking up the nines. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. so that's what I have to say about that. Uh, congratulations. Good episode. Very excited. Almost 8.75. Almost 8.75. Okay, folks. You have gotten yourself through another episode of the Out of Practice podcast. If you would like to join the conversation, you can contact us on Facebook and Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. You can email us at Out of Practice Podcast at gmail.com. You can check out our blog, Out of Practice Podcast.blogspot.com. Convict me for not updating it. You can do us a giant favor and join the jury by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcast or any any other podcasting service of your choice. We will really appreciate it. It helps us a great deal. Speaking of things we appreciate, the Out of Practice podcast is brought to you by generous donations from Leanne Wright's Cloud Lover 69, Jorge Navoa, and the animal bringer, Jennifer Masanova. If you'd like to be one of them, you've got only 30 seconds to do so. Just kidding. <laughs> you can go ahead and leave us a donation, a one-time donation, which we would appreciate, or a monthly contribution as our founding sponsors do. You can find the show notes, the links in the show notes to do just those things. Or if you don't have the cash or you want to spend that money on your family this holiday season, please feel free to do so. You can always just tell your friends to listen to Keith and I. And do us another favor. Go out, hire a 12-foot guy, not to kill somebody, just scare them with some laser sounds. Laser sounds.